Hey guys, it's Drew with a review of Superman Red and Blue. Um, this comic just came out this Wednesday. The concept's kind of interesting. It's like Batman Black and White, which is in black and white. Well, they took the concept for Superman and just used the two primary colors of red and blue, which I thought was kind of interesting. And I didn't think much of it. It is an anthology, so there's a whole bunch of people uh, that are involved. You know, anthologies are mostly uneven. Sometimes it's all average stories. Sometimes there's some great ones in there. Usually, the very little times are there. They're all great, um, and usually they're not all bad either. There's always some good stuff in there. But this one, there was some great stuff, great stories in here that I really liked a lot. And some of them use the the theme and the concept really well. You know, the color scheme really well. Others kind of ignored it and just told a story uh, it, with that color palette and it didn't really make a difference. Uh, I guess I'll just kind of go over the different stories in kind of the order that I like them the most and go that way from my favorite to my least favorite, which doesn't mean that I didn't, I hated them all. I hated any of them. I just, you know, preferred others, some over the others. My favorite one was The School of Hard Knock Knock Jokes. Uh, this is a story by Marguerite Bennett, illustrated by Jill Thompson, and this was uh, a young Clark Kent, kindergarten, I guess, and he's off to school trying to see if he's worried he's not going to fit in. His parents are worried he's not going to fit in. How's he going to keep his powers in check and not cause problems uh, or get outed or get picked on as he will be able to make any friends? You know? So he goes to school and he's worried about all those things simultaneously, but none of that stuff comes to pass. He makes friends very quickly because his parents because of the way his parents raised him they taught him how to be a, how to socialize and make friends and so it just came naturally to him that was great so that's good news but then he notices that there's another new person a girl who nobody talks to and nobody's friends with this causes his, some, him some angst and he doesn't want to ruin the new friends that he's made and become ostracized by standing up for her or reaching out to her, but he also feels bad that she is all alone with no friends. So he, you know, he kind of antagonizes over this, or, or agonizes over this, not antagon. He agonizes over this for a while, overnight. Great talk with the with Ma and Pa Kent that sets him straight, and he makes the right decision that only Superman would make, and uh, all things are great. I mean, it was it was a wonderful story. Um, emotional and and just a really fabulous Superman story. Young, young, young Superman. And I loved it. And then I really liked, surprisingly, I liked the Wes Craig, I'm sorry, the Dan Waters. Dan Waters one is called um, Human Colors. It was about an alien or godlike figure that removed all color from the world. Illustrated by Danny, D-A-N-I. And the concept was all color was gone. Nobody even, they just had a kind of a vague recollection that things used to be different, but they're not sure how. So the guy's talking to Superman about this and everybody's kind of boring and sad and their lives are pretty meaningless because they don't have color in their life. And so he's like, you know what? I'm just going to give all these, this didn't work out. So I'm just going to give all the colors to you, Superman. Let him back in. Don't let him back in. Whatever you want to do. He he agonizes over this and tries to make the right decision. Of course, it's kind of cool what he decides to do, and how he decides to do it, and how it and how it it's shown. That was a really great concept in the way that you could use this color scheme, this color palette, uh, to to tell the story. So I thought that was really unique and fun, and I really liked that. The other story I really liked was called Untitled. It's written by John Ridley with art by Clayton Henry. And that was a solid one. And it was kind of like a standard superhero or standard Superman story that you've read before, probably in an annual or something. You know, uh, just m basically all voiceover, what it takes to be Superman and why Superman is um, who he is. And th that was kind of nice and uplifting and, and fun. I enjoyed that one as well. The other couple were The Measure of Hope, which I thought was good. That was by Brandon Easton with art by Steve Lieber, and I love Steve Lieber art, so that, that the art really stood out to me there. The other one was The Boy Who Saved Superman um, by Wes Craig. 
uh, that was really, really good, and that tugged on your heartstrings as well. Wes Craig did the did the writing and the illustration, so um, that was interesting, and was where Superman kind of failed somebody, and you know the the pain that he feels for that, and so that that was a good one. That was a really good one. so yeah. I guess the measure of hope by Brandon Easton and Steve Lieber, even though it was led by Steve Lieber, the second story must have been my least favorite, but still it was pretty good. So. It was a really high quality anthology overall a lot of fun to read I, I highly recommend it probably not a profitable book uh, I, I can't imagine an anthology uh, working out um, making you any spec money but if you like comics and like Superman comics or like good Superman comics I want to read some good stories uh, this would be a good one to check out I don't see a lot of profit here but I'm going to give a, a B plus and I really liked it, and I hope you read, read at, reach out and read it in some form or fashion, because I think you'll enjoy it, a majority of the stories for sure. All right, thank you, and thanks for listening. Aloha, guys. This is Jason from Hawaii. I'm just doing a mini review of Sensational Wonder Woman number one. Now, it came out this week on March 2nd of 2021. It is written by Stephanie Phillips, art by Megan Hetrick, and colors by Marissa Louise. Now, I don't know if this storyline is any continuation from the Death Metal series. Now, I'll be honest with you, you know, I haven't been keeping up with the Death Metal series. It's basically sitting on my reading stacks. And I don't know if this is um, any tie-ins to the Future State um, titles. And that, basically, I picked and choose um, some of the um, Future State titles. Now, the two reasons why I picked up Sensational Wonder Woman number one is two things. First off, um, Stephanie Phillips and uh, Megan Hetrick were basically promoting it over Twitter. And second, I thought it was a good jumping on point. It's, you know, issue number one. So I figured, you know, why not check it out? So basically the story is basically Wonder Woman is in a coma. And the thing is, I and, you know, her villain, Dr. Psycho, and I believe he's the one that put her in this coma. So in, the, in this coma state, basically, you know... Um, Diana is like a 1950s stay-at-home housewife, basically who takes care of the home, gets, you know, meals ready when when her husband comes home, you know, and so forth. In the real world, Hawk Girl or Hawk Woman is trying to pull her out from this coma by basically saying, Diana, can you hear me? Please come out. Something like that. So, and eventually in the end, you know, in the end of this um, of this issue, you know, Diana, you know, comes out of her coma. You know, she defeats Doctor Psycho, and that's basically the simple premise of this issue. Now, honestly, I like this story because to me, and you know, um, to me, it was like it, it kind of sort of um, the theme sort of to me is kind of remember is kind of says like it's remember who you are, and like I said, Doctor Psycho, you know is probably the one that put um, Wonder Woman in this coma, and he was trying to keep her docile, submissive, as this 1950s housewife, you know. But, you know, to me, Wonder Woman is not that. She's a warrior, she's a fighter, and she's a protector. You know, so, you know, that's, you know, that's one of the great things I liked about this issue. The other thing, the other thing I like about this issue, too, is the art style. Uh, Megan Hetrick's art style, I like it. I do, you know, I, I'm not an artist. I really don't know too much of the art terms, but, you know, this this was really clean. I liked it. Um, you know, it kind of, the art style is kind of like those um, DC young adult reader um, um, stories. You know, the, the, the art style is, you know, pretty clean um, and it's really nice to look at. You know, so like I said, it's really nice. And the other thing too, I like how Megan distinguishes um, the coma scenes because when Diana is in a coma in the nineteen, in sort of the nineteen fifties, that that art style sort of kind of had sort of that Batman the animated series you know vibe to it. So you could tell the difference between you know um, um, the dream state and the reality. Now the best thing I love about this issue. It's a standalone story. For a first issue, a standalone story, that's great. I really loved it because, you know, I got in, I enjoyed the story, it was fun, you know, and then that was it. It was end. There was no, like, you know, um, you know, next issue is this or, you know, or it doesn't feel like, you know, this issue was not feel like it was written for the, for the trades. So, again, like I said, that's why I like this issue so much. It was just a standalone story. 
So my ratings for Sensational Wonder Woman number one, as you guys already know, you know, I put it for fun. It was a great story. I love the art style. You know, um, you got in, you got out, and that's it. So if you guys get a chance, pick up Sensational Wonder Woman number one. Now, you know, also too, you know, have fun reading your comics. You know, um, you know, enjoy the comics that you read. And also too, please remember support your local um, comic book shop. And whether it's you, if it's you know a comic sh- shop in your in your city, or if it's like a mail order service like DCBS or um, or Kawabunga Comics slash um, Deep Discount Comics, you know, um, just please continue to support them. Until next time, guys. Aloha. Hey guys, it's Drew with a mini review for Nightwing number 78. Uh, This is written by Tom Taylor with art by Bruno Redondo. It came out uh, March 16th, so this week. To no one's surprise, uh, wonderfully written and wonderfully drawn by Tom Taylor and Bruno Redondo. It's a nice reset, a good introduction to the character for people that haven't um, read a lot of Nightwing and so it, it's very accessible. In addition uh, to someone who has read a lot of Nightwing, it's wonderful for me too. I, I love the way that it kind of did a little flashback, had some past stuff in it. Those were wonderfully handled. It had a great interesting storyline in the present day that we going forward and being followed. It had a wonderful use of Batgirl, a wonderful use of Alfred, and uh, tugged on the heartstrings, had a great reveal at the end, uh, launching you into the next issue. It was just uh, what you want when a new creator takes over a title that maybe, uh, not that there was anything really wrong with the previous creative team. Um, I know Kyle soured on it, but I found it fine. But, you know, I, I wasn't excited about reading each issue. I, um, again, am, am excited about reading comic, reading Nightwing comics. This was, in fact, my most looked forward to comic of the week. And the very first thing I read. That says something, right? I I read most anticipated comic to least anticipated comic um, each week uh, in some form or fashion. I I don't save the best for last. I know a lot of people do that. I don't do that. Or or sort by publisher or alphabetize it or anything like that. It's just what all came out. Oh, I really want to. I really want to read this. Oh, I really want to read this next. Oh, you know, th- that's that's how I do it. Um, and Night Nightwing elevated to the top. And you know, yeah, yeah, it's Tom Taylor. He's had a fantastic track record with me. I have loved all his stuff, and he's coming off of Deceased and Injustice and um, great runs on their own. The Suicide Squad was pretty good. I like that. I didn't love it, but I liked it. Um, so, of course, I had high expectations. And they were met. And sometimes that's a death wish for a comic, you know? Hey, uh, this this has got to be great. And then you get it, and you're like, oh, man, it wasn't great. It was good. It wasn't great. And, and, and so it's these... In- these expectations just doom a title from the from the beginning, but not in this case. I, I felt like it was it was wonderful, and I look forward to each and every issue coming out now. Um, and I just like the way he, he did it in twenty pages, or whatever, twenty four pages. And I just love the way he handled himself, handled you know so much, packed so much in there that got me excited about the book and the character and uh, going forward. And, you know, I love the Nightwing Batgirl dynamic, their relationship. And that was handled really well. It was wonderful stuff with Alfred's will and uh, bequeathing things to 
Dick that was fantastic and and great stuff about you know his past and bullies and dealing with bullies and um there's just it was just a lot to like in this thing and then the whole package as a, as a whole was wonderful too so um for me an, another another solid a plus and um there was an introduction of a of a of a puppy that yet has as of yet has no name um so I've heard bite wing um so but I said but that wasn't officially in the um in the comic so we'll see we'll see if this dog sticks around they they allude to the fact that the dog should stick around but maybe not you know Nightwing says he's going to dump him off at a pound, but Batgirl says there's no way you'll let it go. And so we'll see if that dog sticks around and if that makes a big deal. So I, I don't think there's a profit potential in here, except for the fact that people might come late to this, not realizing that Tom Taylor took it over and uh, therefore it won't have sold in the quantity it should have. I expect this to go to second print right away um because word of mouth is going to be really solid on it and so i i think it's going to be i think it was probably maybe it was under order maybe it wasn't i mean we knew about it but not everybody pays attention to solicits as much and i think you know word of mouth on this can get people interested and uh, of course there's not going to be anything on the shelf anymore so they're going to have to go back to second print and that could drive this price up. So a little bit of profit here, but but also just a solid comic. Lots of fun. So lots of fun, a little bit of profit, and an A-plus from me. Um, loved it, and uh, look forward to the next one. So thanks a lot for listening, guys. Hey, guys, it's Drew with a mini-review for Nonstop Spider-Man number one. This is a Joe Kelly written book with art by Chris Bacalo and Dale, a- Dale Eaglesham uh, doing the backup. Uh, Alex Ross is two in the covers, so they're fantastic. I uh, wasn't sure exactly what this was going to be. Do we need another Spider-Man book, really? And this Spider-Man is some takes place someplace after he lost his company, so he's poor again, back in the university. So it's in kind of that timeline. It is very frenetic, like right from the get go. It's nonstop action. He's up against like what you would think would be like underpowered villains. They are not like his level, but they have like all this tech and this tech seems to give them an edge and keep them in the game. And he is holding back too, because he doesn't want to hurt anybody. So I thought that was really interesting the way that was. And he's distracted, of course always distracted he's distracted by something that's happened uh to his friend earlier with a a drug overdose and uh, another friend who may or may not be uh, struggling with drug addiction too so there's there's a little bit of a message going on there and usually you know that stuff is heavy-handed but i i thought this worked really well for the story i think peter parker's at his best when he is uh struggling you know most of us in the world don't have it all figured out. So it's nice that our some of our superheroes um, can overcome adversity too, I think. I, I get a little bored uh, reading about billionaires and their deigning to fight crime and as their side hustle or whatever. I, I don't, it's not as interesting to me as like people that are actually real and overcoming adversity and overcoming the odds to act and also doing good that makes i I like that a little bit that's why i've always liked spider-man so yeah it was rough that that part of spidey's story when he was a tony stark not as much fun didn't like it as much as when he's struggling reporter or student or whatever scraping things together lives in a dump in a crappy apartment this has been pretty fun uh, I like this whole thing. There's a backup too, which uh, reveals who the big bad in this series might be, at least going forward. So I don't want to spoil that for you, so you can enjoy that reveal on its own. And the editor makes a point of saying, "Here, enjoy this. I'm not going to tell you who it is, so I, I won't tell you who it is either." 
So please enjoy that reveal. But overall, this is a lot of fun. Good Spider-Man felt really, I mean, although it's part one of uh, so many, however many issue arc, I really liked the way it unfolded, how it, how it expressed itself. And uh, Joe Kelly does good work. So we should have known uh, that it was going to be good. So even though it is part one of whatever, it felt like a really good value for your money story. And then I thought the backup was good, introducing the villain and and who that is. I don't know if I love the dialogue from that villain. It didn't feel like it was a good fit, but it's kind of a nitpick because it was still fun. So curious uh, if anybody else checked this out, what they thought, but I really thought it was pretty cool. For nonstop Sp- Spider-Man, I'm going to give it a fun and a profit um, because you never know with the Joe Kelly stuff. If you recall back in the day, uh, that Deadpool series that he was a part of and how it kind of took a life of its own and continued to sell and go into multiple printing after printing after printing just because it was so good and people wanted it. Um, I hope that's the case here. So so invest in this one, read it and enjoy it. Uh, buy a couple of copies if you can. And uh, yeah, this is a fun and a profit. And um, I think Jason and I might start giving these things uh, letter grades as well. And I'm going to give it a solid A. I really liked it and I'm planning on reading some more um, going forward. So thanks for listening, guys.